This evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Ms. Laura Lee Huttenbeck and her new book, The Boy is Gone, Conversations with a Mau Mau General. And here to introduce Ms. Huttenbeck, we have a special guest. He's a MacArthur Fellow and a recipient of the National Book Award. He holds the Zucker Goldberg Chair in Holocaust Studies at the College of Charleston and is an Associate Scholar in Jewish Studies at the University of South Carolina. And he is the author of the previous books, All God's Dangers, The Life of Nate Shaw, and Tombi, Portrait of a Cotton Planter. Please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Ted Rosengarten. How many times does a, a great book come into your house? You know, some, you just feel, you just know it, that this is going to be a great book. Or, or even more unlikely, that a great writer knocks on your door and walks across your threshold. Well, that, that's what happened to me. And this kind of fantasy appeared in the guise of a tall, blonde, athletic, beautiful young woman who walked into my house. I'd never seen her before and had so much to say about all the things she had seen and heard on her travels through Africa and South America, and an uncanny ability to recall events and conversations in detail and to give them a structure they might not have had in reality. I'd run into this kind of person before, rare as she is. Ned Cobb, the hero of All God's Dangers, a sharecropper, cotton farmer, militant, unlettered storyteller from Alabama, a man named York McGinnis, another black farmer, this time in South Carolina, who became my first friend when I moved to that state 40 years ago, Lorenzo Piper Davis, once a star in the old Negro baseball leagues who was still fielding ground balls in his apartment in North Charleston, and most recently, Lonnie Holly, a visionary artist and performer from Atlanta via Alabama. Uh, and he happened to be the seventh of his mother's 27 children, so he had a lot to say. Uh, and now, Laura Lee, and it's amazing to be in the presence of someone who can command language the way they do. Laura Lee belongs in their company. So when I see a photo of Laura Lee next to Jaflet Tambu, right there, the general, the man who is the hero of The Boy Is Gone, she's not a foreigner at all, she belongs there. She meets the general as an American to African, as a white person to a black person, as a woman to a man, as a young person to an older person. But perhaps most important, more important than these troublesome identities, she meets him as storyteller to storyteller. Each one of them found in the other an eloquent listener, a quality of attentiveness that freed them to trust and to tell. Laura Lee's writing also defies any one identity or another. The Boy is Gone contains great travel writing, journalism, and human comedy, more with an old school sense of wonder and mischief than disdain. Laura Lee incorporates all of these styles and voices, and it takes all of them to encompass the life of this very large man whose narrative corresponds to the momentous transformations of his country from the cauldron of colonialism to a modern state, full of modern people a lot like us. The old freedom fighter grew up barefoot wearing goat skins and graduated to polished shoes and business suits. Just as coming to the airport in Charleston on my way here to Miami, I passed the new Boeing aircraft plant the size of many football fields, and outside the hangar was a bright new behemoth of a plane painted with the colors and name of the customer, Kenya Airlines, a new Boeing Dreamliner. The last thing I want to do is tell the general story or tell Laura Lee's story because she does a far better job of that than I can do. What a pleasure it is for a teacher to be surpassed by his student. Laura Lee lives life to the full. She writes to the full. When you read her, when you listen to her, you feel you are experiencing something. Just a few vital facts. Laura Lee was born and raised in Atlanta. She has a BA from the University of Virginia. She lives on Collins Avenue in Miami, in Coral. And most evenings, you can find her running, but you won't catch her on Miami's endless beach. <laughs> Thank 
Can you hear me okay? Hi! <laughs> this is so ex it's exciting to see um, so many different worlds coming together here. First of all, thank you to Mitchell Kaplan and the wonderful crew at Books and Books. Mitchell, your um, store was the first place that made me feel like Miami could be my home. And um, writers come here all the time and I hear them say, uh, books and books is the best place to do a reading and I'm a little nervous because it's my first place so I feel like you're setting me up <laughs> to be terribly disappointed everywhere else <laughs> but for all the minds and words that you gather together in this town I'm so grateful and thank you also for introducing me to Jessica Jonap publicist extraordinaire and Dr. Ted where did you go thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for being here for me tonight and being there for me every day since December 2008 when I sent you that first email and you said um, do this project and I'll help you in any way that I can. Every young person needs someone that's not related to them to believe in them <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and Dr. Ted and his wife Dale have um, a huge supply, a great reserve of belief in young people and I'm just excited to be one beneficiary of their belief. I also want to acknowledge my mom who, uh, Muriel Patterson Huttenbach, she couldn't be here today, but I think she's watching live stream. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, and um, my mom, being born to my mom and uh, my father, Dirk Huttenbach, and my three siblings, Eric, Marissa, and Pat, was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. So to my lovely, supportive family, thanks. Um, Tonight, I'm not going to be reading from The Boy is Gone. Uh, as you'll find out, the vast majority of the book is the oral history of a six and a half foot tall Kenyan Mau Mau general or, and tea farmer. And I think it would be really jarring if a tall blonde American woman from Georgia tried to imitate that voice. So um, I hope all of you will pick up a copy of the book and let the general tell you most of the story. Um, but what I'd like to do tonight is introduce you to some of the characters that you'll meet in the pages and also some of the characters that I met in the journey that led me to the general. And that journey started here. Um, this is in Lesotho. In, Lesotho is a, an independent country inside of South Africa. And my friend Texas, who I went to University of Virginia with, was doing Peace Corps in Lesotho. And she called me in 2005. She said, what are you doing next year? Why don't you meet me here and we'll backpack together um, the east coast of Africa. And I thought that sounded like a pretty good idea. Um, and so uh, a lot of people ask me why Africa? Why not Italy? I love ice cream. Um, and, and there are a couple answers. One was Texas invited me. And the other answer is um, that I took a course at University of Virginia in Southern African history. And um, Professor John Mason, in, in our midterm exam, asked us to write an essay as if we were crafting a letter from Nelson Mandela's cell in Robben Island and uh, writing a letter to one of his comrades in the ANC, in the African National Congress, and um, advising them on, on what he should do. And this was one of the first times that I was forced to put myself in the shoes of someone living in a radically different circumstance than I have. Um, and growing up in, I studied the American Civil Rights Movement and it always seemed that the nonviolent method of protest was always the, the most effective. And studying apartheid, it made me question the effectiveness of that city, or of that um, strategy. And so that was one reason I wanted to go to Africa. Professor Mason also said that to most American college students, that Africa is a vast unknown or a vaguely threatening place. Um, so that was another reason, just my own curiosity. I'd like to pause actually for a second and just have you think, I'm not going to make you say this aloud, but some images that come to mind when you hear the word Africa or Kenya. Just get some images ready. Okay, so some images that came to my mind um, and that are in recent headlines of the New York Times. Um, you'll see from this sampling that it's pretty much all sad, scary, or confusing from um, Africa. You'll see some words that just jump out at you. And I couldn't really imagine what a conversation would be like with 
some of the countries that I'd be traveling in. Um, and the great Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, she has something to say about stereotypes. She said, the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. And they make one story become the only story. So in July 2006, I bought a one-way ticket going to Johannesburg, and I told my parents that I would be home before Christmas. Um, and this is one of the first impressions that I had of Africa. This is in Lesotho. It was the coldest winter they had since 1984. They had snow in the lowlands. My parents called me and said, how is Africa? And I said, it's freezing. <laughs> um, and the only animals here are <laughs> goats and cows and chickens. Um, and I think National Geographic is full of it. And I did not pack <laughs> for a cold winter either. From uh, Lesotho, I went, whoops, this was, to orient you, this was my route. Um, South Africa is in parentheses because I didn't really spend time there. I just traveled through there. I started in Lesotho. Um, you'll see that in, in the red in South Africa. I went up through Mozambique. I cut across Zimbabwe. I went into Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya. And then all that was by public transport. So by bus, minibus, train. I think there was a donkey cart, bike, boda boda, motorcycle. Um, <laughs> All that was by public transport, and then I flew from uh, Nairobi to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and then from Addis I flew to Cairo. Um, <laughs> so it was quite a journey. I, before we get to Kenya, I want to highlight just one country, um, which is Zimbabwe. And um, riding from Mozambique to Zimbabwe, I sat next to this woman named Doris. Um, over the course of two travel days and a variety of mishaps, we became very good friends on this bus ride. Uh, she helped me with a lot of things. There I am. Um, in front of us sat this man, John. And he, when he found out I was American, he's like, oh, I, would, I love America. I would really like to buy you some Beatles. And um, <laughs> I said, oh, Beatles, like thinking that his English was bad. I was like, what, is, what are Beatles? He's like, do you not speak English? Beatles, the insects. And I was like, oh. Um, so in that part, it was like a local delicacy. They were roasted. Um, they tasted a lot like Slim Jims. I don't know <laughs> if you like crunchy Slim Jims. Um, and then I asked, I, I inquired about the protein content in beetles. And he said, actually, mice have much more protein than beetles. And he's like, I'll buy you a, a mouse at the next bus stop. And I said, you know what? Like, I am so full from the beetles. <laughs> but um, I would love to buy you two mice. And so it was like a mouse jerky, too. It was like dried mice. That's what he's eating there. Um, Doris, by the way, had never tried beetles or mice, so it might have just been a big joke on me. I don't know, <laughs> um, but I didn't eat the mice. <laughs> and so um, at the end of this two days, right when we, Doris and I were about to part ways, she said, do you want to come back to and visit my, my family's farm and come to my cousin's funeral? She was going to her cousin's funeral. And I said, okay. Um, these were some of the images from that trip. Her niece, Mandy, who I have on my back there, had never seen a white person before, and she was terrified of me. Um, and she would not stop crying until they strapped her on my back. Um, and this was after I, I'm like, I'm so good with kids. <laughs> um, and she was terrified of me. Um, then um, Doris's mom there, I'm washing the dishes there in the, in the wheelbarrow with her. Since then, I don't think I've ever complained about unloading or loading the dishwasher um, and sweeping the yard. This is the aunt she gave me a chicken. And this family was one of the most generous, wonderful, kind um, people, families that I'd ever met in my life. And when I asked Doris why you were being so welcoming to this strange white girl that you met on a bus, um, she said, because uh, in our culture, we just love visitors. And we know that your people would do the same for us. So this experience in Zimbabwe was um, really important to understand my mentality for when I met the general. I was just really open to people being good and kind. And when I met the general, he had actually just come back from um, a trip to the United States. And we started swapping travel stories. And he loved the stories from Zimbabwe. He said, I told him that when I was sweeping the yard, um, that neighbors had come over and said, uh, who is the new white worker? Who did you, how do we get one? <laughs> we really like that concept. And he thought this was um, really funny. Um, and this is what the general told me. He said, I like the way you're learning. You're getting to know the people. If you want to say anything concerning people, stay with them, live with them. 
it is the only right way of understanding if they are either good or bad. Um, at the end of dinner at that restaurant called Texas, he said, tomorrow I'll pick you up at sunrise and we're gonna go pick tea. And I met his wife, Jessica, they'd been married for 60 years. Um, Jessica taught me how to pick two leaves in a bud, a stem of two leaves in a bud, which is the highest grade of tea, the freshest grade. So when the Kenyan workers were picking, it was like a blur. They were so fast and agile. I would really have to focus in each stem and pick it and then get approval and place it delicately in, in the basket. Um, and the general and the farm hands kind of gather and they're watching this and the general stands up tall and he goes, ah, he goes, you are the best white worker we have ever seen. <laughs> And I was like, oh, you know, thank you. I'm very flattered. You know, <laughs> how many other white workers have you seen? He's like, none. Uh, but you are very good. So when I would call him, I would say, you know what, am I still the best white worker? He's like, yes, yes. Anyone challenge me? No. No, no, <laughs> no one challenged me. Um, from there, this is another picture of Jessica and I sorting tea, Jojo Jessica. Um, from there, we went to the tea factory here. Um, and then he took me to the tea farmers cooperative that he had founded. Um, and all along the way, people would address him either as Mwalimu, which was Swahili for teacher. Um, they'd also address him as chairman, which came from his position in the farmer's cooperative, uh, and also in Njori and Cheke, that's the indigenous council of elders. Um, or they would call him general, or um, general in Kungi. And that title came from the 1950s, from his leadership in an uprising against British colonial rule that became known as the Mau Mau Rebellion. In our first days together, he told me stories of how we'd grown up wearing a goatskin loincloth and later how we'd become involved in the independence movement. He told me that as an African, as a young man, he couldn't vote or elect his own government, yet he had to pay high hut taxes. He was not allowed to grow tea or coffee because only European settlers could grow, crash crop, could grow cash crops. He couldn't move freely or get employment in his country without kipandi, which was an ID card that was to be worn around Africans' necks in a metal tin. And though the general, his land was not taken by European settlement or disrupted, most of his Gikuyu friends, uh, their land was taken. So if you'll see the dotted areas there, that was called the White Highlands, and that was all taken by European settlement, and um, Africans who'd been living there were displaced and moved on to native reserves. Um, so the general started talking to a lot of um, his Gikuyu friends. Um, Pre President Jomo Kenyatta was a Gikuyu. Gikuyu are the largest ethnic group in Kenya. They make up, up, up about 22% of, of the population. So um, in, the, in 1950, the general got involved in the, the business of dealing timber, which was also illegal for Africans. Um, this is what the general told me about timber. He said, Europeans did not like anything that could make an African have money, so selling timber was prohibited. That's why we were calling it black market. We Africans were dealing timber like cocaine or heroin. If you were caught, they took it and arrested you. So um, I only spent about three days with the general on that first trip in 2006. And um, on my final day, I met Moredi, who is the general's youngest son. And I asked Moredi how I could learn more about his father's life. And he said, we don't even have a birth certificate to document my father's life. Um, we have said we needed to record his story, but we haven't done it. And you know he's getting older. Dad will be 86. So even though I didn't have much time with the general, I could feel that entwined in his life was the history of Kenya. And through telling me personal stories, it made Kenyan history come alive and accessible. And he was a heck of a storyteller, too. So um, I went back to the States after this first backpacking trip and settled into my comfortable American life. I got a job, um, I got a gym membership, I got an apartment, I had a car. Um, but still, I, I didn't forget about the general, but I could feel his wisdom slowly slipping away from me. And this quote kept on coming back to me from Zora Neale Hurston, who said, there is no agony like burying an untold story inside of you. And that's kind of, I felt that the general, the general story was just tugging at me. And, I also saw that the tape recorder idea, when, when Moredi had said that there's nothing recorded about the general, I said, oh, I'll try to help. And I was thinking, oh, I can send a tape recorder and that'll be good. But I, I quickly found out that that idea wouldn't work. Um, the general's kids were all busy leading their own lives and um, didn't have the time or the energy to record, to sit down and interview his father, uh, uh, their father. So um, in 2008, I sent an email to Mordevi and said, you know, I checked in on the, his father's health 
and said, would you like me to come back and, and record, your father, uh, record your father's story? And they said, Kiribu, which um, meant you are welcome. So um, that was good news. And then I told my parents um, that I was going to go sit at the feet of a Mau Mau general. Um, and this was their reaction. Um, <coughs> OK, actually, that was their reaction to something else that I did. But um, <laughs> the, the sentiment is still there. <laughs> like, my, my parents were, I learned quickly that um, they had a very different impression of the Mau Mau Rebellion um, from the 1950s and early 60s. This was the image that came to their mind, um, thanks to Hollywood. So this was one, this was one comic strip, uh, Robert Rurick's novel, Something of Value, which was made into a Hollywood movie starring Rock Hudson and Dana Winter, Sidney Poitier. This was an article in Time Magazine from 1960, and they described how Mau Mau murdered their victims from methods ranging from merciful garroting to having their heads bashed in and brains removed, dried, removed, and ritually eaten, I think. Um, this is another one. Um, so I was having trouble reconciling these images with um, my memory of the Mau Mau general, which was this, um, with the kitten, or this, um, with his purple Crocs and cardigan with his granddaughter there. So um, in spring, and, and this is what I thought, I thought, who better to tell the story of a Mau Mau rebellion than a soldier who fought in it? So in spring 2009, I, um, bought, a, I, I bought a ticket and I arrived in Kenya, and I lived with a general's son's family. That's um, up at the top corner. I would take a Boda Boda motorcycle up to the General's Tea Farm and um, sit with them pretty much every day. That was his one-story stone house of the General's. Um, and on the first day together, we <laughs> um, I asked him, he said, how do we start? And I said, OK, let's just tell me when you were born, how many brothers and sisters you have, and we'll go from there. So two and a half hours later, um, he had outlined his entire life down to the most important days. And it was a feat that I don't think I could have accomplished in my own 26 years. Um, and this request, and this reflected a, a rich tradition of oral history, a training in oral history. The general, when he was a kid, got his uh, history by visiting elders, by sitting at their feet and learning up to seven generations of, of family folklore. And this is why I agree with uh, Professor Jeff Fadiman, who says, every time an old man dies in Africa, a library is lost in mankind. I would amend that to say man or woman. Um, and um, so I just want to give you, um, when the missionaries came, they, they introduced the Western system of education. And this system of, of this tradition of learning from their elders was disrupted. And I want to just give you a taste of what my conversations were like with the general. So here are a few interviews that I had um, that I reported in 2009. And the first one is the general talking about how the missionary influence affected the African psyche. You know, you, the very beginning, these elders were very terrible. Because once somebody became a missionary, he pretended to be completely different from the other people. We the got away with the, our customer wake up grand time and they adopted the the the, the, the religious culture which was very strict because the missionary wanted the, their missionary people to become this role model of the of the time. So you could uh, to become a member of the church or you had to live a lot of things. Capisa separate yourself from any our tradition of Kwame and even culture. So I should also note here that the general wasn't nostalgic for the days without schools or hospitals. He um, loved school and loved learning how to read and write and learn English and Swahili, and that allowed him to participate in a global culture. Um, but what he wished is that the colonial administrators and the missionaries took time to understand aspects of their culture, which gave them both individual and communal identity. Uh, this next clip is an interview with two reverends, um, Reverend Kireru and Reverend Yaga, that were both from Meru. Um, and the general is going to tell of an incident that, forced, that he, he was forced to resign from a teaching position in a missionary school. And I'm my life. 
on my bicycle from school to to, to, to go to for for lunch. I was caught in the church. I look at my game again, look at that. That is really cool. Uh, I was caught in the discipline court. Ale, ale, that I've made the mistake by carrying a woman out and should be suspended from the holy uh, community. On your bicycle, on my it was And I was a teacher. And it was a teacher. Uh, that's a any thing. person claiming to be a Christian should not uh, give right on a bicycle to a lady. That was uh, as close to a, a, a doctor. So he did it. He carried another woman teacher to school. Then he was told, come on. This is wrong. In the court, in the, 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 this is sin. In the court, you have to be to suspended to from the church. And I have to abuse it. So what, what did I do? Am I not sitting with that teacher? If I want to do anything, could it do it on a bicycle? No, I was serious. I was serious. Hey. The, the doctor have not looked at you with that. Yes. What are you telling me? <coughs> then I did disagree with them. I said, I don't know you have to call it or yes. or whatever. And I'll call it. Even further than that. <laughs> You get a little taste of the general sense of humor, too. Um, and this final clip, um, so when I was thinking of the, this guerrilla war in the forest, I w not only did these soldiers have to fight the British and the Home Guards, which were the, the Kenyans loyal to the British, um, but they also had to avoid wild animals like elephants and buffalo and leopards. And I just couldn't imagine how one survived in the forest for um, two years and what they ate and, and how they lived, and um, this is one of the one of the, my favorite stories that he told me. I know you said that sometimes you killed like buffalo when you went and, and looked for food. How how did you kill the buffalo? How would you get well, such a food? We were digging holes. You know, you know they have like, they they have their parts. They do they have their ways in when you going to, to look for water. In the first if you go even now. When you see the road, the road, the way that uh, these elephants move, passing, they have their ways. Very much one big one. This, this is the way that we could make a big hole, and the cover is using grass. When they are moving, one gets in, then they couldn't get up. So what? Hmm. Ah, we killed most of them. <laughs> very many. See, that is the way where they go for water. And we make you take that soil away from the area of the world that they have We cover it. You could get it too. If one falls, they are not trying to jump up and they are together. We ate a lot of them. That way. Yes. Even if this is some of the Cambodians, four pharaohs do that. <laughs> that you know, because they see the sand there, they don't know where the, the hole is. If you fall that you find <laughs> you find them in and then people could come up. Now we didn't want to put the stakes, you know, so we know we have they we we want it to if you don't want to make a very big hole, but we didn't follow that because man our people even could fall to it. You put an uh, a very chap either tree, I mean uh, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah stick, sharpen. Now when somebody fought to it, it goes through and the kill it. So there was no movement of anything. When it got there, it died. So we did not follow this because of the people. This was a short way of getting meat, but we didn't do it. I remember we were we were making it one one day. After covering it, going, my father turning away to take my clothes where I found it. <laughs> I fell down in bread and was in the evening. That. <laughs> and he said, if we put that here, we are not singing down. <laughs> we have general <laughs> meat. <laughs> <Our habits. laughs> so we are getting meat, man, meat in that. <laughs> so after um, three months the, in 2009 with the general, I returned to the States to transcribe our conversations and begin the process of crafting the manuscript that 
I hope you'll hold later. <laughs> um, and in December 2010, I delivered a first draft of the manuscript. And um, this is a, a short video with um, some of those scenes of delivering the first draft of the manuscript to the general. I told the general I didn't want to come back to his tea barn until I had a book to deliver. He told me in old age, things can change a lot in one day. Bring what you have. We need to see you before the end of the year. And so I returned. sure what the goat was at the end of that. I think that's um, an effect of editing late at night. Um, so fast forward three years to December 2013. I got a publishing contract with Ohio University Press um, and I needed to go back and ask a few more interview questions of the general and um, I went back with a professional photographer named Mary Beth Kaith who happens to be sitting in the front row right there. Mary Beth, can you wave? <laughs> um, if any writer has the opportunity to be best friends with a professional photographer, I highly recommend it as a storytelling um, strategy um, and just as a healthy friendship. <laughs> um, but uh, as I interviewed the general, Mary Beth took portraits of um, the surrounding landscape and the Tambu family. Uh, this was her Kenyan shoot. Um, Kenyan style, I guess. And I'm just going to show you a few of her images. Um, a lot of her images are in the book. Uh, she also took the cover shot. Um, uh, T. Mary Beth. Um, and, and for the last part uh, of our village or our, of our visit, I will read 
from the last part of my author's introduction to finish that visit and take you up till today. Uh, during our visit, the SACO, which is the Farmers Cooperative, was in the middle of an audit and the general's phone rang off the hook with questions from headquarters. He told me also we are organizing a study tour of Bangkok. If my health allows me, I will go next year. We were together when we heard the news that at age 95, Nelson Mandela had died. I asked the general what he thought about it. That is the way of all of us, he said. But he used his time. He can go now, peacefully. Because, the general continued, Mandela fought every moment he was alive. Four months later, back in the United States, I opened an email from Moredi with the subject line, News from Home. The general was dead. In a few short months, Africa had lost two giants, one who was known to the world and one who is not yet known. Through his life story, however, the general will not be forgotten. Moredi wrote to me, I got the call from Niaga at 1.48 that they had just arrived at the hospital by which time the general had passed on. He had arrived home earlier in the day on Sunday from a trip to India, and I understand that he was all jovial and strong then. It was the general's second trip to India where he traveled with the Yetu Sako Society Board of Directors to benchmark and form partnership. On Tuesday, April 15, 2014, the general was buried at Matunguru Presbyterian Church of East Africa on land he had donated. The service lasted four hours and more than 2,500 people showed up. During one of our last conversations, I had asked the general what I now realize was a stupid question. I asked him, do you think you're representative of Africans? And he gave his answer. He said, you know, you are American, said the general. I'm African. Do you think all American ladies are like you? No, not all Africans are like me. Not everyone comes to the extent of knowing that these are all ladies and these are all men. You take somebody as he is. So there's a lot more left to the general's story, which um, I hope you'll hear from him. Uh, but I think we have a little time left. So if you have any questions on the work or me or this book, I would love to hear them. How did the, the question was, how did the family react to the um, manuscript and the history? They were pretty delighted. Um, the closest uh, friendship that I had was with Moredi, but I also was good friends with his daughters. Um, I sent one book over there. I hope to go back in Kenya to launch the book um, in uh, December. So um, I'm also working on Kenyan distribution for the book. I hope that I'll get a sponsor to like subsidized publication there, but it's, it's a big priority of mine to get distribution in place to have it available in Nairobi bookstores and have it in Kenyan libraries and Kenyan histories. Unfortunately, the Western model doesn't really make sure that the work always gets back to where the history was created, but it's, um, I definitely want to do that. So I should be going back to Kenya in December, and I hope, I hope they like it. <laughs> Was the title completely your idea, or did the family have some input, and why The Boy Is Gone? That's a great question. So she asked about the title, The Boy Is Gone. Um, it was a quote from the general. He was talking about the traditional rite of passage, which culminated in circumcision at age 16 for men. Um, and he said after a period of healing that when they emerge, the boy is gone, the boy has gone with men. Um, but I felt that this is a huge theme of the book, is this theme of transformation from traditional to modern, um, from youth to adult. Um, and one other tie-in was that before independence, all white settlers referred to Africans as boy, regardless of, um, regardless of age. And after independence, you know, they said, let's address each other as men um, with more respect. And so that changed. So lots of different... Um, tie-ins, but The Boy is Gone came, originally came from a quote by the general. Mm -hmm. You said that you were going to backpack with your friend that was in the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. but when you were on the bus with Doris, is it Doris that was your friend? Yep. Were you alone? It looked like, like we didn't see any of your friends, so she parted ways with you. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, we would both want to go to different places. She had another friend that was in town at that time, so they were traveling together, and um, so I... Uh, wanted to go to Victoria Falls and um, I had told my parents that I would not be going to Zimbabwe but I have a terrible sense of direction 
Um, and I, <laughs> I didn't know that I had to go through Zimbabwe to get to Victoria Falls. So um, I called my parents really late at night um, and when they were sleepy. And I was like, I'm in Zimbabwe. Everything's fine. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> like hung up. Um, so Texas was not with me at that point. And we would both want to do different activity. I wanted to climb Kilimanjaro. Um, and so I think she went to Rwanda at that time. And um, we would meet up. We would pick a place and then just ask around, like, have you seen anyone that looks like me <laughs> um, around here? And, um, but she was a great travel partner. She was adventurous and friendly and open and asked a lot of questions. So other questions? Yeah. Um, you, did a really, you did a really good job of, of presenting how you know, the kind of racist iconography associated with the, the rebellion against British colonial rule in Kenya. I was wondering, you know, how big do you think the gap is between the way that at least that rebellion at least was perceived in the West and the way it was perceived in Kenya by people like the general? Um, it's a great question. So it's um, how the um, how how Kenyans perceived the Mau Mau rebellion and how um, and how the rest of the world. The, the general was actually pretty aware of um, the portrayal of not only the Mau Mau, but also Kenyans. Um, he said, I've read a lot of books about Mau Mau that um, say that you know, Mau Mau were eating other people and um, we were killing other people, yes, but we weren't eating them. And he says that's the author trying to put something in a way that will sell books. Um, in 2005, there were two great books that were released. One of them won the Pulitzer Imperial Reckoning. Um, and another one was called Histories of the Hanged, and they were both um, bestsellers. And uh, I think that did a lot to contribute to like a revisionist history. Um, and, uh, and just recently, Mau Mau has become a legally registered organization. It was a terrorist society for 60 years, I think. Um, and now the, the government is finally recognizing that um, these people had real grievances and they um, were freedom fighters or independence leaders. The general also, as I said, was aware of how Kenyans were perceived. He told me one story um, that one of his tea farming colleagues went to um, Mauritius for a tea conference and um, one of the guys, he said from a western country, asked uh, his tea farming colleague, he goes, I've, I've heard that in Kenya everyone lives in trees, is that true? And um, <laughs> the general's friend said, that's absolutely true. Yes, we have. Um, I left, my, the airport is on top of a tree that I left um, to get here. And your ambassador also lives in a tree. So Kenya is a very special place um, <laughs> where we can all live in trees. So he kind of had a good sense of humor, but he was aware. And I think that's probably, a lot of people say, why did the general trust you um, t with his story? And wh how did you have such a good rapport? Um, and one thing is that he wanted to tell his own side of the story and he wanted people to get to know him. Um, and the other was he was just excited to have a young person that was interested in hearing his stories um, because his, grandparent, or his grandchildren were in school and busy. Um, and sometimes history doesn't feel like history when it's still with us at the dinner table. So um, but yeah, that's, thank you for the question. Other questions? Yes. Hi. So you're a young modern writer in a digital era, and your presentation was very modern and multimedia. How is that, or does that affect you as a writer of books? Do you present differently than earlier generations because you're in a digital age? Um, so the question is um, if I present differently than, um, or how, how the current technology contributes to my presentation versus other generations of um, author presenters. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> because I, this is my first talk and um, <laughs> this is how I chose to present it. We live in a very visual uh, culture now and I feel like because Africa is such an abstract theme to so many people, if I have these tools and resources to put you in, you know, put these people and put this landscape in front of um, you, I find that more effective than having you relying on the images that come to your mind before that. Um, and you know, because this is an oral history, I like the general to speak for himself as, as much as he can. And in the interviews, I wanted you um, to kind of hear his voice so when you're reading this, you can um, put his voice to, to that. Um, and, and also, his reveals a little bit of a sense of humor. And um, so yeah, I, I also had a writer friend tell me that um, 
at readings, most of the audience, um, they'd rather hear what a writer e ate for breakfast um, rather than read <laughs> directly from the book. Um, so I didn't tell you that. But um, <laughs> I thought that doing a more interactive presentation and kind of giving you a behind the scenes of how I came to tell this story, because I do seem like an unlikely narrator for this story. So um, I think people are very curious. That's always the first question that I get is, how the heck are you telling the story, and um, why aren't you writing a cookbook? Um, which <laughs> that that's seriously been told to me. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I want to commend you for three things. One is the presentation of what you just described. <laughs> Number one, many people go to Africa. They do research. They write. They tell the story, and they tell the story like uh, National Geographic. All you see is animals. There are no human beings. Where are the human beings in the story? So when you humanize somebody who was an important figure in the in one of the most important colonial revolts in Africa, and two, in your presentation, you humanize the people that you met. It's not only animals, it's not only forests, it's not only mountains, it's the people. And so I commend you for that. Number two, you took a manuscript to the family. Many people go to Africa, they do their research, they come back, that is the end of the story. The people who provided the material, they never see them again. You took a copy of the manuscript to, they have a copy of the book, all right? People in Senegal have my book, people in Ghana have my book. So I want to commend you for that, because not only taking, you are giving back. But what is even super, you are launching the book in Africa itself. Because books that are published here are never, except when the publisher is African and has branches, books published and most of them never get to Africa. Many people can never buy these books. You know it. You know the exchange rate. You cannot afford it. But for you to look for a publisher, so that the price can be manageable for the people and for the people to hear their story. That is very commendable. And I think it's, you will go far. That's what I would say. You will go far. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I can't take all the credit for not including animals. Um, I had, um, <laughs> I never saw a lion in Africa. Um, I had like no budget, and the entry fees for the national parks <laughs> were like my yeah, absolutely, and right, and it's but I can't. It's not like a moral position. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I would love to go back to Africa though and go to Masai Mara or something. Actually, the general took me um, on a safari in Meru National Park. Um, and we didn't see a lion, so he said, next time you come back, we'll go to Masai Mara, I want you to see a lion. Um, and so maybe, um, depending on book sales, <laughs> I can afford to go on safari sometime. Thank you so much, though, that means a lot. Thank you. Yes, Miracle. You mentioned the general was buried in the Presbyterian church <laughs> setting. Was he a practicing Christian and, and his family? And was there any political pushback on this introduced foreign religion? How accepted when you were there was Christianity by the people that you met? Uh, that's a great question. So um, was the general, did he convert to Christianity? And um, what was the reaction of, um, of the community? He was the first person in the family to get baptized. Um, to go to school, you did have to become a Christian. Um, and actually, his name, Jafflet, comes from uh, chronicles they had to get when they were baptized they had to get an English name a British name so um, for that came from the Bible um, his family his dad was more okay with it than his mom they weren't allowed to eat um, uh, what is it called cloven toad um, they weren't allowed to eat uh, pigs they, they had pretty much a kosher diet before the Europeans came before the missionaries came and so when the missionaries came and said oh no we can eat um, pigs his mom was absolutely um, disgusted by that and said, okay, well, you're going to have to use your own plates and everything. We don't associate with people that eat pigs. Um, 
And so the diet was kind of disturbing um, for, for them. The father, as I said, was pretty accepting. Um, and he, he did become a, a, an elder in his church. He had a pretty conflicted relationship with Christianity. As from the story, he saw some hypocrisies that he couldn't reconcile. Um, but in the end, he thought it was good for the community um, to have the church. He, he donated the land that the church was built on. Um, I went, when I was living there, to many church services that were over two hours long. Um, and they, uh, for offering, sometimes they would bring in um, actual fruits of their labor. So um, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, pineapples, and then they would auction it off in chickens too sometimes. Um, and so that was actually fun. I didn't, they, the whole service was in Kimeru, but I did love these auctions and I would sometimes get competitive and like uh, buy bananas and stuff. So you could like go shopping in church, which was um, kind of cool. But uh, churches on Sundays, everyone's decked out in their village in their best clothes and going to uh, church for anywhere between two and four hours. So thank you. of passing it on to generations and generations? I, I hope that there will be more of uh, an oral tradition. The question was um, the oral tradition nowadays. The general really was regretful that um, his grandchildren didn't know the stories that I knew, um, and even some of his children, too. Um, there was one time where we were sitting with, with his son, and um, he goes, his son, and the, the general started a story, and he said, I'm going to go, I have to go to the bathroom and take care of something, like, and Kirote finished the story, and um, so I took over the story, and <laughs> they were like, how do you know my father's story so well? Um, and so I, I'm not sure. I hope that um, the general was hopeful that now that they have civilization, that they can get back to elements of their culture that um, bonded them together and um, that were positive. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, my, my name was Inkirote, which, um, so most people at first, was they were calling me Mzungu, which just means white person in Swahili, um, and also running. I would sometimes lace up my running shoes um, and go running, and uh, the villagers <laughs> would look at me, and because um, you know the stereotype of that all Kenyans run marathons. Um, they would be like, Mzungu, why are you running? And I'd be like, oh, I'm just exercising. They're like, is somebody chasing you? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 Every, it's not, it's, um, I'm just burning energy. They're like, why don't you work? <laughs> like, why, why don't you go harvest something? Like, plan something, be productive. Like, why, like, they thought it was the stupidest thing they'd ever heard. Um, and so, from Mzungu, everyone would say, Mzungu, Mzungu. Um, the general would try to tell them, no, her name is Inkirote, and Inkirote means, um, Muredi actually named me, his, his last born son. Um, it means a generous person, it means a good manager, um, and it means someone that makes a home easily anywhere. So I really loved um, my name, Mary Beth, when she was taking pictures. Mary Beth, what was your name? Kawera, um, which means, so it's kind of their way of welcoming you um, to the community. Kawera means hard worker because the general was always seeing her taking pictures and he was like, she's going to be Kawera. <laughs> like, she won't put down her camera. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's common. And actually, I collected nicknames going through my whole backpacking trip. I um, would, would get different nicknames in different cultures. So. Other questions? Yes? How much time did you actually spend in that? Um, how much time did I actually spend in Africa? The first backpacking trip up the East Coast, it was six months. Um, and then I went back in 2009, that was about three months. Uh, and then I went back in 2010 for about three, three weeks, I think. Um, and then I went back again December 2013 for about two weeks. Um, so whatever that adds up to. <laughs> Other questions? I was there uh, 50 years ago. Not too long after the end of colonial rule, and there was a, a, a euphoria. It was palpable. There was a joy. There was an innocence. What did the general think of the current state of affairs near the end of his life, by comparison to what his hopes were at the beginning of the month? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So the question is, what um, after the euphoria of independence and everything that they worked uh, for coming to fruition, how is it manifesting in today's um, society? The general didn't really like to talk about modern Kenyan politics. He would always say, refer me to the old times, that new stuff, politics, you can get it from 
somewhere else. Um, and so I, I think um, he, he also said, youth today, they have good TVs, but um, they're not always, get, like, they, they don't always perform responsibly when they're put into higher office. But he wasn't really talking as a Kenyan there. He was kind of talking as um, an older man watching young people. I think I would hear the same thing from a lot of um, American 92-year-olds um, reflecting on kids today. Um, but he was distressed with the state of corruption. Um, and um, he basically said that it was a civil war and it takes time to recover from a civil war, as we all know, covering um, even in recent media the Confederate flag and everything. Um, it, it just takes time for people to put aside differences and, and work together and rebuild. And um, so he said, you know, we are settling our things. It'll take time, but we're settling our things. So I think in the end he's hopeful, but he did sometimes speak as an old man that was just like, why do kids not act responsibly and um, do the best that they can? So, other questions? Yeah. What's your next project? <laughs> <laughs> Raven, can you stand up? For <laughs> this, um, <laughs> this is Raven. Um, if you know him, he started running January 1st, 1975. He runs eight miles every day um, in, in South Beach. He hasn't missed a day since then. He's seen every single uh, sunset in South Beach, and um, I'm writing. Raven's biography. I <laughs> and uh, we, this was a bit. We actually had this planned, um, <laughs> so, um, and so it'll be kind of a history of Miami Beach as told to how how Raven's running path is intersected with Miami Beach history. And this man's memory is um, just as good as the general's for sure. He recalls every detail, not only like the, the conversations in a car, but what song was playing on the radio, what color the interior was. <laughs> like Raven has a very great memory, so I think it'll be an exciting book. Um, and he hasn't run alone in 10 years, too. Um, so a, a kind of um, a lot of a collection of characters along the way, too. Over 2,300 people have run with him. So that's what's in the pipeline. <laughs> Thank you, Raven. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here. I miss everything about the general. Um, his patience, um, his voice, his perspective. I remember in the publishing process, I was getting very frustrated. Um, and it had been a couple years and um, since I'd taken uh, the research. And he just said, you know, in Kiderte, sometimes you have to be patient. Um, <laughs> I'm like, General, you're 90 years old. Like, how, <laughs> how patient can you be? Don't you want to see this book? Um, <laughs> but just he's so kind and he also never scolded me for what I didn't know but commended my desire to learn and um, he would say we live to learn and so he never wanted me to be intimidated by something that I didn't know he just um, you know ignorance doesn't exclude you from learning about anything so he just always encouraged me to ask questions and um, and I think that's a really special relationship to have with an adult when or, or not even an adult but someone that um, has a very different knowledge from you. And um, so I just loved his encouraging um, demeanor and never scolding me for, oh my gosh, how do you not know who Jomo Kenyatta, I knew who Jomo Kenyatta was, <laughs> but um, that equivalent uh, of that. Farouz, um, by the way, we <laughs> when I first moved to Miami, we um, waitressed together for about a month and she's from Eritrea and um, she told me when we first met um, that most people think that that's where? In the Caribbean, right? Yeah, they're like, oh, Eritrea, is that, um, is that in the United States? <laughs> where, where is that? And so when I met her uh, on the second day, I was like, oh, Eritrea, we couldn't go there because I was in Ethiopia. But um, <laughs> she was like, who are you? <laughs> and where, like, wh where have you been? And how do you know um, where my country is? So I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, Farouz. Other questions? Yeah. Got one, two part. First of all, Tell everyone what his nickname is for you. <laughs> Secondly, when the general made that decision, because this point, I don't know, but when he made the decision to actually become a general to actually embrace the revolution, and I'm assuming just being a normal average person, that's a big deal against overwhelming odds like that. 
can you share the mindset of what was, if he showed it with you? How did he get to that place in his in his own being to do that? But you can talk about your nickname first. Okay, first my my Raven nickname. When you finish the eight miles, you get um, inducted into the Raven Run community. Raven, do you wanna? White Lightning. <laughs> White Lightning is my nickname. Um, and the general, of course, talks a lot about um, how he made the decision to join Mau Mau. Most of the people in Mau Mau were um, landless peasants, people that had lost their land. Um, the general was exceptional in that he was literate. He was a primary school teacher. He had a lot to lose to go by going to the forest, and it confused a lot of people in the village, like, wow, you, you were really um, successful. Why would you turn against these Europeans that gave you all these opportunities. Um, and because he was one of the few literate men in the forest, he was quickly promoted to secretary and then worked the way um, up the ranks to, to general. So it was a tricky decision for him because he, um, did, he was living a pretty stable life and had an income. And, um, but it got to the point where, you know, I want to elect my own government and I want to use the land that I have how I want to and plant what I want to plant and got to the point where he said, no, enough. Um, I'm going to fight. And um, that eventually led to independence. So it was a means to an end, but he gambled that the end would be independent. And any more questions, folks? This gentleman in the back, final call. Um, I'm wondering whether you interrogate what has been written about the Mau Mau before your own. I haven't seen the book, so I know it's an oral history project, but I'm wondering whether you interrogate you know, you, in your presentation, you showed the racist image, but I'm wondering whether you interrogate any of the writings, whether in books or, you know, from the two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question of outside research um, influencing the text that I included in the questions, um, it definitely influenced. I read a ton of books um, on the Mau Mau Rebellion. What I was very clear, though, in my focus that I wanted to tell this one man's story from his own perspective. So you'll see some footnotes in the book. Um, for instance, um, chocolate chip. Oh, I, what is your real name? <laughs> Steve. Um, so <laughs> the Raven Run, we don't know real name. So this is ch chocolate chip. Um, Chocolate Chip was telling me about um, his impressions of the Mau Mau and a quite fearful um, of the Mau Mau, and um, I'm not sure where I was going with that. I lost my train of thought. Um, what was the question again? About <laughs> the readings. Oh, right. Okay. So he was saying that um, that they were killing white people left and right. Right. That all these settlers were dying, and actually, between 1952 and 1957, 32 white settlers died at the hands of Mau Mau. More white settlers died in car accidents than. Um, at the hands of Mau Mau. So those specific things, when I, when I know that the impression is that Mau Mau's were just killing um, white settlers haphazardly, and um, then I would fact check. And um, also, but some of the statistics even, um, if you've been following any of the, um, the reparations case in Britain um, and the new documents that were released, um, a lot of information is, is even coming out now. Um, down to how many soldiers were in the forest. So I tried to get the best sense, but I was not trying to write the end all be all book on Kenya. I just wanted to be very clear in my focus that this man's story came to light and I hope it joins a, a dialogue, a discourse, um, and a conversation that's already out there in the field um, that with other scholars that have done very different work and brought other information to light. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. Okay. All right, folks, so a reminder that we have The Boy is Gone, as well as Ted's book, All God's Dangers, for sale at the counter in the front room over there. Laura Lee is going to be signing here at the table to the right of the screen. I want to thank Ted Rosengarten for that beautiful introduction. And I'll also, Laura Lee, if this is your debut appearance as an author, then you have to promise to come back for your next book to Books and Books. Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing, folks. If uh, we have such a great turnout here tonight, if when you got up, you folded your chair and stacked it against the wall, that would be a big help for us in getting the room cleared safely and quickly so you could all line up to get your book signed. So please 
Give Laura Lee Hutton back another hand. Thanks very much.